So, guys, Jaron Raven with 12 health. I'll try to get through quite a bit very quickly, so just bear with me. Okay. All right, 12 health is founded in 1969. We're a fairly qualified health center. We're also a community health center and mental health agency. Uh, I consider us a health justice organization, and the reason why is because over the past 50 years, we've done a lot to deal with the social determinants of health. We've built housing. We built a grocery store in Blue Parkway. We've been involved in, in research and ha had another company that did development and training for African American professionals. So, um, in addition to all of that I've mentioned, we serve about 45,000 patients a year. Most of our patients live uh, at least 70% below the 70% of them live below the federal poverty line. 94% um, live both 100% below 100% and 200% of the federal poverty line. Um, most Jared, most, well, let me interrupt you. We're not seeing your screen. Did you get a chance to share your screen? I did. There we go. All right, there we go. All right, sorry about that, guys. No worries. All right, I'll keep going. Hey, brother, um, take your time. No need to, don't need to be <laughs> quick, but don't hurry, all right? We, we, got, we got you. Sounds good. All right, 44% of our patients are uninsured. A um, majority of them are diagnosed with some type of chronic disease. Uh, hypertension and diabetes seem to be the leading cause. The average 12 health patient is a black woman between the age of 24 and 36, um, somewhere in the area code of 64130 and 64132. Typically a family size of two to three kids. All right, that's just a representation of where we are in the Kansas City metro area. Nine locations should be 10 before the end of the year. Okay, you guys know these definitions, but I'm gonna go through them very quickly to frame the conversation. Social determinants of health, conditions and places where people work, live, and play that affect health, quality of life, risk, and outcomes. Health disparities, health disparities are preventable. Differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, and opportunities to achieve optimal health. And of course, health, health equity. It means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. These are commonly accepted social determinants of health. I think people have different definitions. There's food supply, housing, you see economic and social uh, relationships. You can throw income in there as well. Transportation, education, and of course, healthcare. So this is a county health rankings model as they discuss social determinants of health. And this is particularly important. I want you guys to pay attention to the way that I think the logic model runs. So you have policies and programs that affect health factors and then those health factors affect health outcomes. Uh, to the right of that, you'll see your physical environment. They rank at 10%. Uh, you will see social and economic factors at 40%, clinical care at 20% and health behaviors at 30%. Um, I think this is critical, but I also want to, want to share one small um, amendment to this, to this logic model if possible. And that is, this doesn't account for personal behavior and practices. So it's policies, programs, I call it policies, programs, personal behavior, and practices. And I'll give an example of what I mean exactly. Um, not long ago, I was told by a friend of mine not to drive to a Missouri suburb because of the cops. And the ability for me to interact with them and not have um, an interaction uh, that could may or well, may or may, may not likely leave me uh, injured and or hurt. Right, so that those are examples of stressors. For example, um, right, I'll just give you an example, Rodney King video. This, that was happening in 1991. That means we've been watching black people be brutalized on television now for 30 years. And so I'm using that as an example of mental health disparity because as you talk through um, what is the outcome of African-American children, men, adults, seeing those pictures, seeing those images for the last 30 years. We've been seeing that since 1991 and even before until now. So for example, physicians, physicians who oftentimes, not intentionally, but through implicit bias may uh, dismiss black, uh, black women's pain, uh, may provide a curtailed treatment, uh, treatment options as a consequence of, of their dehumanization of that person, um, and, and offer less pain management options to certain, certain patients. All these things are not in policies and programs, but they're individual practices that impact health outcomes. So this is where I think it kind of hits home. This is structural racism as a model of how it impacts um, education, all sorts of determinants of health, education, access to quality care, housing, working opportunities, and, and economy, sorry, economy, typically context and factors and social injustice interactions, right? So this is a good example of how structural racism really plays into social determinants. So 
kind of just examples of how structural racism deals with social determinants of health. So what you're talking about is, for example, KCPS has a long history of having uh, relatively segregated schools. For example, uh, the vast majority of charter schools in Kansas City are opened up in communities that don't necessarily need them. These are communities um, that their schools are struggling. In fact, uh, there's a large disparity between um, low income communities and having lack of education options. There's that. You have food supply. There's, there's, including the one that I'm in, is a, a 64130, uh, is a food desert. And that typically is represented in the eastern, northern, and central regions of Kansas City. Uh, housing, housing must be stable, affordable, and adequate to live in a safe environment. We know that Truce Corridor acts as the body line. And then there's trans transportation. So, I mean, there's good and bad policies. Luckily, uh, Kansas City is looking at a regional plan for 2050, but there's also, in that plan, it does regard those who are of low income in that transportation plan. But these are just examples of some of how, how the health disparities play out, right? So in 1963, they looked at eight homes, four west of Truce and four east of Truce. Those homes ranges from $10,000 to $17,000. Now, or at least in 2018, those homes range from $45,000 to $363,000. You don't have to guess which one range, which direction. So the, the, the homes west of Truce with $363,000, right? So what we're really talking about is, is, the, is the robbing of generational wealth, which then plays into health disparities. And so that's just one example. In terms of education, I talked a little bit about census tracts and uh, why certain communities don't have uh, charter schools. This is a quote from Amber Northern of Fordham University who did, a research, did research on uh, charter schools in the Kansas City area. And was talking about how in, in lower income uh, census tracts, there were almost no charter schools when higher income areas had several to choose from. And then finally, uh, life expectancy, right? So where I sit right now at 12 Central 64130, uh, there's a 15 year difference between our zip, this zip code and a zip code in the plaza, even though they're only seven minutes apart. Talk a little bit about how you've seen uh, health disparities, racial injustice deal with itself in COVID-19. Right, so we already know the coronavirus disproportionately affects people of color due to underlying health conditions, uh, and also low risk that are low income are more likely to have higher risk of chronic conditions. Right, so African Americans 3.5 more times likely to die of COVID-19, Latinx community two times more likely to die of COVID-19. This is Kansas City Health Department. Um, it says 3.2 percent of workers in service occupations use public transportation. Two percent of residents having problems paying for education necessities. You'll see that African Americans at 47 percent, white at 18 percent, and uh, Latinos and Latinx community at 26 percent. Then we're looking at deaths from COVID-19. To the Latinx community, which is only 10% of the Kansas City area, uh, overrepresented in this at, uh, at, at the death rate. Uh, and if you look at total hospitalization, African Americans are overrepresented, even though they're only 29% of the Kansas City community. All right, so how has Hope Health dealt with COVID-19? Well, today we tested nearly 6,000 people. We tested, tested on both sides of the state line. We have two clinics in Wyandotte County and seven on the Missouri side. The vast majority of those uh, testing have been pop-up events and not necessarily at our central location. Uh, we have a approximately 10% positive rate uh, for context. The national uh, positive rate is about 5%. Uh, and the Latinx community represents 65% of our positive cases. All right. The good news, guys, call to action. So I hope to leave you guys with just a little bit of a direction I think we can go forward. Proposing a model called Academy Communities of Health. And what, what this is, is a model that was uh, deployed in Washington State to divide the state up into regions and attack specific social determinants of health with backbone organizations, nonprofits, hospitals, managed care organizations, and others to work together in a particular region to deal with at least one social determinant of health that they chose. That's just me describing social determinants of health. And this is how Washington State divided their state together. So I think there's nine in total, um, each of which has different social determinants. Some chose childhood obesity, others chose diabetes, um, others chose housing, transportation. But this is the way that they divided it. But this is particularly important because I want to I want you guys to look at this chart for a moment, this graph for a moment, 
And what this is, is all the different community health needs assessment from different providers together. And you'll see the highlighted areas are the synergy between where we probably could be working together on some of these things. Behavioral health sticks out, diabetes, chronic disease, addiction, access to healthcare services. These are all the things that are really representative of new strategic planning from different healthcare organizations and community health needs assessments. And these are things that they're doing possibly in silos that we could be doing together. To give you a perfect example, Jackson County has a community health improvement plan from 2019 to 2021 that only covers Eastern Jackson County. Unified Government over in Wyandotte County has another community health improvement plan from 2018 to 2023. And the Johnson County has a community health improvement plan, or JOCO, from 2017 to 2019. All together in the Kansas City metro area, there's probably 30 to 60 either CHIP plans, community needs assessments, or healthcare organization strategic plans. But what I'm proposing is that if we really want to do regional advancement and really deal with health disparities, we should really be thinking about a regional move to deal with health disparities. And this is an example of the MARC, uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Council map that is showing 119 cities, nine counties, two states, and one region, and the ability for us to work together to think through health disparities to move the region forward. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jaron. Thanks, Jaron. That was wonderful. Sorry, I ran through that quickly. I appreciate it. Well, you generated a lot of questions and a lot of thoughts. So, really appreciate uh -oh. that you uh, you shared those. You shared that 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 data. Really appreciated how you talked about the different plans and how that has is an opportunity. Um, so thank you so much. We'll uh, circle back to the questions we have for you um, a little later. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and the Director of the Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. All right, thank you so much. All right. I, all right, thanks everyone for joining me um, and I, am uh, an interloper. I was joking with uh, Todd just a few days ago. Let's see here. I'm trying to share my screen and this is not it. Okay, this is it. Uh, I'm an interloper because I'm really new to the Midwest. I have only lived here for a year and new to uh, Nebraska. And so in many ways, I'm catching up on the statistics. The other thing where I feel as if I'm an interloper, I'm a historian by training. I study the 19th century, so I study dead people. And so, because I wrote a book on the history of American gynecology, I've really been pulled uh, into the public health sector. And it's been wonderful because for me, it's really great to put the past in conversation with the present and to see that many of the things that we're dealing with are actually not new at all. And so although this is going to be about maternal and infant morbidity and mortality in Nebraska, I really want to uh, frame this in a broader conversation around the historical markers that help to create negative social determinants of health and what we can do to move forward. So first, statistics on Nebraska's Black maternal uh, and infant morb morbidity and mortality. Why is there a black box? I get paid to research for a living, and there are not concrete examples of these stats that are paired together. It's really, really hard to find. And so typically it's fragmented into uh, Omaha because Omaha has the largest African-American population in the state, but it's really hard to find. And so this black box really represents the, the gap right, that there is a gaping hole um, where we need to really collect this data. But in many ways, the state is following um, the, the country, right? Typically, states have more precise and accurate data than the country. And so what this means when we have these kinds of gaps in our statistical data is to really think about right this fragmentation and how we can make sense of it how do we read between the lines how do we answer the gaps and so what that means is race and ethnicity specific mortality rates for infants right it's not encouraging 
So for infants less than one year old, the 2017 mortality rate for black infants was significantly higher than that of all other racial ethnic groups. Nebraska is no different, unfortunately, than other states in this union. Children ages one through 17, rates for African-American children higher than that of Hispanic and white children. There were no significant differences, thankfully, uh, in, in the same year for child mortality rates. And so if I can put on my professorial cap for just a moment, in order to contextualize this, I often use a framing of slavery and freedom. And what does this mean? During slavery, and as I said, I, I write about reproductive medicine and the history of gynecology. During slavery, there was a real focus on how do we protect and maintain the reproductive health of Black women. Now, it wasn't because these men who owned them or the doctors who were recruited to treat them um, cared so much about them. What that meant was a healthy Black womb meant more money for, for the, the slave owner, essentially, right? So the economic investment lay in the healthy womb of an enslaved woman. And so many of the developments that happen in obstetrics and gynecology tended to happen on the bodies of enslaved women through medical experimentation. Immediately with freedom from 1865 onward, all of a sudden the very thing that had been praised before, so-called black female fecundity and the ability to have lots of children without pain, all of these kinds of things are now looked down upon, right? And so you start to have the rise of these tropes of the welfare queen or the irresponsible baby mama. And what also happens is there's less of a focus on Black women's reproductive health and more of a focus on how do you stymie the number of births of these financially dependent people who are economic burdens on society. And so the Black maternal crisis is not something that just happened in the 21st century we see these startling statistics have been happening, unfortunately, for decades. So what do we know nationally? Right? Black women and birthing people are the most impacted racial group in the US. And this includes both rural and urban residents who are impacted by this crisis. This is also something that is unique to people of African descent. Doesn't matter your income, your education, your relationship status, the stats are damning across the spectrum of Black birthing people. In the developed world, right, and that means high income earning nations, the US is the most dangerous place for Black women uh, and birthing people to give birth. Why? A continued legacy of medical racism. The prior speaker talked about some of these negative social determinants that affect the quality of life. So whether you have money, power, resources, right? Um, these things affect the ways that these folk are treated. And primarily in a space like Nebraska, where you have such stark differences as well in Black populations. I live in Lincoln, and the Black population here is less than, you know, it's sometimes fluctuates between four and six percent, but it's in the single digits. Whereas in Omaha, you have a little bit over 13, about 14 percent, right? But those, the differences tend to be really stark. And so I know where I am now, there is no sustained African-American community, right? Because UNL has bought up a lot of those um, predominantly Black communities and historically Black communities. And so there's also a kind of fragmented nature of where people are living. You don't find that so much in a larger metropolis like Omaha, but the stats tend to be the same. So how do we change this? And I'm trying to be cognizant of the time because I have 15 minutes. Um, so we change this by really calling a thing a thing, right? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention hasn't declared racism as a public health crisis, but it should do so. And I'd like to talk about the kind of trajectory of when the CDC first realizes that there is a public health crisis where medical racism sits at the center of that for Black people in this country. And it was in 1998 under the Clinton administration, then Surgeon General David Thatcher 
I'm sorry, David Hatcher, um, wanted to do a large scale program where he could erase all of those negative social determinants, right? He was saying that this is ridiculous. There shouldn't be such a wide gap between black quality of life and white quality of life. And so he thought in 10 years, if the focus was on erasing this, it could happen. Unfortunately, it hasn't. And in the field that I study and write about, we can see that um, it is really dangerous for black women and black birthing people. And so the CDC has to follow the lead of certain states that have declared medical racism a, a crisis. And why should they do so? Because the CDC a few years back set up a criteria for a public health threat. And racism meets all of that, right? It places a large burden on society. It disproportionately affects a segment of the country's population. The U.S.'s current measures are just not enough to solve the crisis, and an expansive and coordinated public health approach is needed to eliminate racism's negative effect on society. And so I'm going to uh, stop sharing here. And so what's really at stake is how do we have uh, doctors, medical practitioners of all stripes, how do we have them actually see Black patients as human beings who are not trying to somehow, you know, exploit the system? Um, how do we see them have uh, practices that respect the patients? Now, the wonderful thing about public health is it's a bit ahead of the curve, right? And so the Association for uh, Public Health had, um, I think it was in uh, maybe 2014, I wanna say, or either 2017, but already declared, racism as a public health crisis. Um, so public health tends to be a little ahead of the curve, but if we wanna really get a handle on the ways that we treat um, black patients, particularly those who are in vulnerable um, states, right? So when you're pregnant, uh, if there are complications, then what, was, what must we do? We have to also, and I say this, not tongue in cheek, we have to stop raising kids who are anti-Black. We have to stop raising people who are sexist. Um, I was a postdoc at UVA, so I tend to um, <laughs> I kind of beat up on UVA a little bit, only because I was there. In 2016, UVA releases a study that it did in 2014 of their medical students and residents. And these are folks who literally believe the same thing that doctors in the 18th and 19th century believe. Black people didn't experience pain. If they did, it was minimal. Black people had thicker skin. Black people's blood coagulated more. I could go on and on. Black people tended to want to have narcotics for pain management because they were substance abusers. And all of the stats show that in fact, African-Americans use illicit drugs and narcotics less than white Americans. And so, you know, I'm saying, how do we stop this? We have to start with really simple things seeing Black patients as human beings, and literally raising people to not be anti-Black in their racism. It shouldn't be racist at all. And also stop being sexist, right? Some of these students believe that uh, women did not have as many nerve endings in the upper vaginal area. Once again, these are things that are coming out of really elite institutions, where I'm not doing the research, but literally white doctors are doing the research, right? And they're showing this. And it seems to not be changing. And so I am hopeful that with these kinds of conferences, with all of the information that we have, also a renewed focus on the maternal morbidity crisis within the Black community, people will finally start listening to what reproductive justice and birthing justice activists have said to start to change the curriculum in many of the schools that uh, doctors and nurses attend. And so I'm going to stop here. Um, I welcome your questions. I hope I have stayed within the 15 minute timeline. I typically talk for 30 to 45 minutes. So I, I hope I also wasn't rushing through this, but I wanted to get some of the, the information out. And so I welcome your questions and your comments. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, this, this is how this is gonna work. We're gonna have our presenters available for you to ask questions. I'm going to, to monitor the, the chat box. So we'll start with a couple of questions from the chat box. And then um, if you have a question, you want to vocalize it, 
uh, we can try to entertain that. Just do your best to, to uh, there usually is a hand raising thing. Do we have a hand raising function on this, on this bad boy? Uh, yes, if you, uh, as a participant, uh, if you click on participants, you'll see some options there um, where you can go and raise your hand. You, like uh, Barb Manning, it looks like, and Lucia. Then uh, Todd, if you see, if you look at participants, you'll see the hands raised uh, come to the top. Okay, I see some hands raised. Um, why don't we start with uh, Lucia? Did you did you have a question you want to have answered, Lucia Jones? Um, yeah. So I wrote it on the on the chat. I think I don't know if it makes sense, but um, I think the question was for um, Stacy and um, Stephanie from Humana. I was wondering. You know, as we keep, we, we're moving towards value-based care, but we all have the understanding that healthcare is mostly the, the result of all these socioeconomic drivers. However, our healthcare system is uh, still very focused on investing in clinical care and clinical advances. So do we, what is the, the vision or what have you, or the conversation on, on the, at the leadership level or state level or federal level or whatever, and how are we going to move payments or create bundles of payments to reinforce those community-based organizations and resources that really can have an impact in, in health? And the second thought to follow that is, um, when we are funding and thinking about funding community, socioeconomic needs, always with the thought or the lenses of justice and not charity. So not just covering holes in society, but transforming our society with those investments so then we have a more um, a more fair society of course um so i can take a little bit of that and then i can also let um humana talks thank you lucia those are great points um and i will say that yes this definitely came up and so in early 2018 when we went around to all the healthcare leadership and talked to them about what are their priorities what are their needs what um you know are the biggest drivers of things that you know, are um, things they're worried about and want to change, you know, social determinants of health was right up there. And so like, everyone does recognize, you know, the payment system that we currently operate under, um, and the need to keep moving it forward. You know, I think that we just have to keep um, advocating for showing success of interventions that help address the social determinants of health so that we can get payers on board. I mean, ultimately we need the biggest payer on board. I do know that, and we have, so like on our advisory board um, for the QVIC, we also have all of the commercial payers um, regionally on there. And they, a lot of them have started doing different um, payment programs that do address some of the social determinants of health. And um, to give you like one flavor, for example, what one of our programs, when I, I mentioned the Transitions of Care Project, um, we have different tools that were using in the community. One of those tools um, is very specific to the social determinant. So it's as soon as patients are discharged from a hospital with heart failure and they go home. Okay, well then how do we manage them in the home? Because you know what, many of them don't live in a home that has the appropriate modifications for them. It doesn't have, they don't have access to healthy foods. Even if they can get foods to them, they might not be low in sodium and et cetera that they need to control their heart um, condition. They may not, you know, um, they don't have a vehicle as many we've talked about transportation just to get to their appointments for follow up care. And, and the and everyone is really recognizing that that is needed. We know 80% of our health care happens outside of the hospital walls, you know, or of our health, you know, it's impacted by what happens to us outside of the walls, all the social factors. And so what we're trying to do is it's called the managed services network. Um, we're implementing this, it's with the Mid-America Regional Council. And so how it'll work is hospitals would refer a patient to the Mid-America Regional Council. They serve as the central hub to identify the high need patients that are most in need of these services that don't have access to them. And then they do an in-home visit to assess their risks and um, what they need. And then they develop and have the relationships already built up with all the community-based organizations to deliver those services. And what um, the QVIC, what our role is, is really to help them to implement that, the MSN, and then to quantify the outcome so we can show what the return on investment is, so we can take this to the payers uh -huh. and so that we can really get them heavily engaged in and the hospitals because 
they see a return on an investment. When you impact the health of these individuals, it, it does affect their bottom lines and that's how we can move the needle. And so I think that we're trying to focus on it from that lens. Um, but I do know um, uh, that the payers might wanna talk about their um, things they're doing in this as well. I don't know if our Humana um, representative is still on. She may not be. Stephanie, are you there? No. No, she may not be. But yeah, did I did I answer? I'm not sure if there was did I answer. No, that that, that was that was great, Stacy. And I work for an MCO for United Healthcare, and oh, and great. we had a conversation too. But I also I always want to hear, you know, what else is going on? What else is going on? What are the thoughts between different partners of the system? What are the conversations taking place? Just mm -hmm. just to learn more. Yeah. Yeah. And Todd, I think we just I, keep chipping away. <laughs> Todd, could I add to that? Sure. Yeah. So um, that's Dr. Colvin. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, that's great. I think one of the struggles is that with like patients with heart failure, um, you're already dealing with a very expensive chronic condition in adulthood. And how do we prevent an individual from developing a chronic health condition? And one of the struggles is knowing the science about life course is how do you um, kind of uh, display the evidence that will result in prevention of a chronic health condition? So how would you develop a, a program for let's say pregnant women that, would, that you know will later decrease an adult health condition when the insurer is not gonna see that return on investment for 20, 30 years, 40, 50 years, and it might not even be their, um, their client anymore. They might not be even insuring that child anymore. So it's very complicated um, in terms of where we're investing, how we're investing, um, and demonstrating benefits to payers. Yeah, but can I, can I add something to that? Sorry. You know, for me, is I don't believe that funds should be taken away from clinical care because we depend on clinical care and the advances of medicine and important for the health of all. I just feel like our, our government should create an extra line of funds, maybe using funds that are being used to, for war or for something else and use it to invest in the social aspects of health, um, create payment systems to support that community-based approach to healthcare. Not that we have to take the funds that already exist for healthcare. I think that that, that will, as you said, in maybe 30 years after investing in community, we'll see a decrease. But it's true, it will take, it will take time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when, even when you look at the data on all the other countries, you know, um, so many others spend money on social support systems and, and things that impact prevention across the lifespan, but also things that are going to deal with all of the things outside of direct clinical care. And, and we spend far less than um, nearly any other country. So yeah, there's definitely room for improvement on investing in social um, supports. Okay, wonderful. I'm looking to see if we have any hands raised. Looks like Amber. Um, Do not up. worry about that last name. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Um, so we, so I work with a very chronically ill population. I work with dialysis patients. And one of the things that I come across is a lot of these folks are very, are low income. Um, a lot of them have been on disability for a lot of their lives. And a lot of them just don't have the ability to understand a lot of written communication. I've got several people who just don't speak English. I've got lower, um, lower cognitive functioning. What kinds of things are some of these organizations doing in order to kind of address the need to get education to people who can't read or don't understand English? Who wants to take that question? <laughs> Hi, this is Dr. Cooper. I'd like to address that if I could. That's okay. Yeah, go right ahead. 
Um, well, one, the, I'm addressing the, the question about um, healthcare education for those where English is not their first language or where they've not um, been able to gain the ability to read or understand more high tech types of, of languages and what's going on with asthma ready communities out of University of Missouri Columbia is uh, we're collaborating with VidScripts, which is, I'm sorry, my dog has decided to bark the mail man, I apologize. <laughs> it's all good. Anyway, <laughs> and so what's happened is we have uh, collaborated with several physicians, mainly, mainly, mainly um, pediatric pulmonologists. And uh, with that in mind, the, they're putting together what's called vid scripts, which are short uh, 90 second to two minute uh, oral uh, instructions for following the instructions that are given in the doctor's office. Oftentimes when, when people are in uh, that type of situation, when we're receiving instructions from a physician or, or other healthcare provider, they might not have the questions that they want to ask. They might not understand the instructions at the time. So recording these instructions and making them available at, a, at a, another time where they can be listened to by the care provider or the caregivers, other family members, um, and also by the patient to say, oh, I, I understand now. They wanted me to take this twice a day. It needs to be in the morning and at night, or I need to come back in six months, or whatever the instructions are can be done orally and there's also a visual as well so they're for lack of a better term kind of little mini youtube uh videos on how to follow those instructions and how to get the healthcare education so that's what's going on with um, asthma ready communities out of university of missouri columbia wonderful thanks for sharing that anecdote did you have a question you want you wanted to ask dr cooper i saw no, your I was hand was raised I was raising my hand to say that I would address that question. Okay, okay, wonderful. Okay, and thanks. Todd, if I could as well, to piggyback on Dr. Cooper, again, I'll put it in the chat, but we have a number of folks on this call right now that do exactly that. So community health workers are absolutely positioned to be the connector. That's why community health workers have to come from their communities. They speak the language, they understand the culture, and they are positioned to be a part of the health team to be able to help physicians and nurses and social workers better understand what's going in the home. Community health workers can get data that would never happen in an exam room. That's exactly why they're there. Mm -hmm. and, will impact, that. and that will impact the cost of the whole system and uh, start uh, you know, tipping and tilting uh, the healthcare from intervention to prevention and value base instead of uh, um, paper services. Jenny Weiss, did you have a question you'd like to ask? I did, thank you. Um, I'll see you next, Lisa. And here in Nebraska, um, our knee high is where hospitals essentially, I'm gonna use common language, do data dumps around um, the populations that they serve so that they can track patients across populations. Um, as a state, we're looking at a platform called Unite Us um, that offers social determinants of health um, and the ability of members that are within Unite Us to track referrals. So if a um, patient client is referred on to another service um, in the community, they can, through this platform, they can get data feedback, how it went, did they show up? Um, what were barriers that were identified, et cetera. Um, and I know there are multiple platforms like this that help support social determinants of work, um, social determinants of health out there. As we have these conversations, what have been some of the lessons learned in communities that have implemented these platforms and what are some of the questions we should be asking to make sure that this is successful? Yeah, um, I don't have experience with any of those platforms. Um, but what maybe a little, some of my thoughts to share with you is, um, take for instance, food insecurity. If you actually look at the screeners for food insecurity, it's not really about food. It's about money. Do you worry that your money will run out before you have more money to buy food? And so I think what is needed in a lot of these kind of 
screeners and connectors is, is there a place within them where someone can take a deeper, a deeper dive into the root causes of those needs? So a lot of times we like to kind of have this knee jerk response where if food insecurity is the issue, we're providing food, but we're not looking at other issues such as why does the family not have enough money? How can we support them through employment? How can we provide them with additional benefits that will then allow the household to have more finances to afford food? Um, is there mental health problems underlying? Is there substance abuse problems? Is there chronic debt um, that's underlying it? So I hope that within these systems that connect individuals to sources and track them, that there's time in there for a deeper dive. And just like Mr. Crawford said, that there's, you know, community health workers are a great resource for doing that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Dr. Colvin, for responding to that. Lisa, did you have a question you'd like to ask? I did. Um, as a health economist and researcher, I'm just wanting to know if anyone else is concerned, uh, I guess what I should preface that with, that I use the Census Bureau's uh, American Community Survey to get a lot of data and to base research upon. Is anyone else worried that we're cutting short our census and we may be missing out on some of the the groups that are in most need that we need to actually have that data to do research and are you worried and do you have any uh suggestions or what we can I, I can very briefly give you my experience uh, because I've been asking folks uh, that I work with, especially in the Hispanic community about the census. Uh, people are scared um, given the political climate right now and given all the rumors that unfortunately were effective in scaring people away of thinking that if they fill out that information will be cross-matched. And unfortunately, in some states it is seem to be happening that it's being cross-matched with other uh, databases to identify undocumented um, folks. Um, so they are very scared. And even people that have told me that 10 years ago, they did fill it out because they understand what it means. Now they don't trust. Um, and and up, even though I know all the implications and what it means, up to a point, I understand that. So especially in the Hispanic immigrant community, there's a lot of hesitancy. Um, I still try to educate them and explain them what it means and what it is for. But um, my surprise has been that they know and that they are aware of the importance, but that they are not trusting. You know, I, I want, can I add something to that? This is Lucia again. Oh, my camera is off. Um, okay, Lisa, ahead. to your question, I am I'm not, I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I was born somewhere else, as you can tell, um, by my accent. You know, in my country, the census represents something completely different. And when I saw the census that we got and those three questions or four questions, I was like, and this is the big deal, the drama around these four questions. When in my country, you have a, a someone in your house for about four hours going through surveys and surveys, asking questions about employment, income, level of education. I don't know. I don't know how many questions they ask you. They take, everyone takes that day off. It's a national holiday and people sit on their home and have these kind of social workers come into your house and ask questions and, and bring in that data back to the state. So, um, I'm not giving any solution. I'm just saying that there is no doubt, as, as Laura is saying, that that bad relationship with, with our government is leading to that disconnection between also what are their real needs? How do we communicate those needs uh, in a systematic way, et cetera? Well, that's what the American Community Survey, which is like an extended version. There, there are people that actually uh, get an extended version of uh the census bureau and and, and follow-up questions and i didn't they, know that there is if you go to the census bureau there is huge amounts of information regarding things like food insecurity and it's called the americans uh, community survey and they look at 
food insecurity. They look at education levels. They look at a lot of the different, uh, what I consider to be, you know, social determinants of health. And I'm just really concerned that if we cut short the census, and we also have people scared to even reply that we're, we're just not going to have the, the information um, that we really need to address problems. Yeah, I think that's a valid concern. I appreciate you raising that. And I think this is some folks that are working on um, those types of issues. Please reach out. Lisa, is that okay if you throw your contact information in there? Maybe we can connect you with, someone can connect with you around some 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 uh some solutions or at least develop a a group that's looking to look into that more closely we i think we all can recognize that um the conscious effort to to lower the amount of census by this administration around this around this particular issue so um it's just it's untenable but it's also um it's clear it's clear what they're trying to do so thank you for that you know, I'm going to, um, it's 12.35, I don't see any other hands raised, and that's okay. What I'm going to do is move into the Health Equity Awards. We're going to take a quick beat and and then shift to Mariah Kranz. Mariah, are you ready for that? I sure am. And then I'm going to try and give us a longer break um, until uh, till 1 o'clock. So we're going to do our Health Equity Awards recognize some incredible people. First, let me say thanks to all the presenters that provided such incredible information. Stacy, Dr. Forrest, I really appreciate you allowing us to use to uh, use your model. This is a KCQVIC model. So if you like these different perspectives represented in this way in short presentations, her present the the KCQVIC pre um, presentations that she listed that go throughout the year are, 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 you, are replicated in the same, same fashion. So we appreciate you letting us use that model this for the conference and um, hopefully this will uh, connect some folks to what she's doing with KCQVIC and this will be something that we can continue to do. 